Good evening, and on behalf of uh, Major General uh, Mike Myatt and the Marines Memorial Association, I'd like to uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, Meet the Author program. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us tonight, uh, Kale Weston. Uh, additionally, we have uh, as a guest here at the hotel, um, our Assistant Commandant, uh, General Jay Paxton and his wife, Debbie, welcome. My name is Chris Starling, and I'm the Director of Military and Veteran Affairs here at the uh, Marines Memorial Association, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Cale Weston uh, represented uh, his country serving in the Department of State uh, for over a decade, and seven years of that time he spent uh, forward deployed with frontline troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, primarily with uh, Marines and not just in those countries, but in the, the most kinetic and volatile regions in Al-Anbar province in Iraq and in Helmand province in Afghanistan. Uh, his book is called The Mirror Test and it has received many positive uh, reviews to date. It ties together the events of 9-11, the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, and the current state of affairs in the Middle East. Kale is what we as Marines call a muddy boots diplomat. He spent a lot of time with us in the field. Most of his career, um, uh, like I said, embedded with Marines. And for his service with the Marines in Fallujah in 2004, Kale was recognized uh, with the Secretary of State's Medal for Heroism. Please join me in welcoming Kale West into the Marines Memorial. Um, thank you, Colonel Starling. I want to thank. Uh, this association and the club for inviting me. I was uh, told that of all of the stops for a new author, uh, San Francisco, but especially here, is a real highlight. And when you walk into the author suite, you start to feel like an author. Yeah, I was just in Portland, and you know, as a city of book readers, they uh, threw some questions my way that uh, got me thinking differently about the wars, even though I spent seven years in both wars. So I will probably narrow my speechifying uh, and have it be a dialogue sooner than talking about a 600 page book too much. What is the mirror test? If I do read part of the book, it's usually to uh, really not read what I wrote, but to read what uh, a Marine named Aaron Mankin wrote about his moment uh, looking at the mirror. And so I thought I would do a little bit of that uh, I don't like reading my own book, um, mainly because I think we're all geared to fall asleep when you're read to. Um, so I will, I will start with a little bit of what, what Aaron, uh, in his own words, I think eloquently said about when he was badly disfigured in a roadside bomb explosion in Al Ambar a few months after I met him, when he was prepared to kind of see how war had fundamentally changed him. That frame I then try to expand over the next several hundred pages into how have these wars also uh, changed us uh, as a nation, uh, as a military, as a State Department, um, what are some of the traditions that, that uh, maybe uh, look a bit different these days. Let me uh, do that real quick and then I will tell you about the organization of the book, uh, what I tried to do with it, uh, some of the themes that hopefully come out uh, through various chapters. Uh, and then I'll even talk a little bit about why we have 16 pages of photos in the book, which are not just random photos. They were carefully selected by two or three editors and I over many hours in uh, a big building in Manhattan, 90 of which are my own photos. So let me read Aaron about the mirror test here, uh, and then I'll, I'll proceed in that direction. Medical doctors in military burn care units who treat wounded veterans describe a key part in the recovery process. They call it the mirror test. In this defining moment, morphine is no longer necessary as treatment has progressed. IVs and catheters are removed. Bandages are peeled back. The disfigured patients must then contemplate a first look into a mirror at his or her new self. The most familiar image that once greeted them morning at night over a toothbrush or under a razor, their own face is gone. Doctors pay close attention to this critical juncture. Will the patient's gaze into the mirror signal one of recognition, horror, sadness, pity, surprise, resolve, or will the patient instead turn away? Will he or she, will he or she 
begin to accept the same but different person now inhabiting the glass. Medical staff let patients decide on their own when the time is right, as skin can be grafted, but acceptance cannot. Days, weeks, months can pass. Many wounded veterans delay this day for as long as possible. They might only choose to face the test before young family members arrive for their first hospital visit, fearful that a child's reaction might be more difficult than their own. In an interview with Best Life magazine, Aaron Mankin describes his own experience. It was a month and a half before I was ready to look at myself in the mirror. Then one day, I got out of my hospital bed to go to physical therapy, and I saw the mirror I'd passed countless times, refusing to see the truth about how hurt I was. I looked over my left shoulder, and there I was, this torn up, frail, thin, individual with open wounds on his face that I barely recognized. And my worst imagination became my reality. I cried. Being a Marine, you want to tell yourself you're fine. Just walk it off. But I couldn't walk this one off. I covered the bottom half of my face with my elbow and looking at my eyes and my forehead, I didn't look any different. I knew inside I was still the same man. But not everyone would see that, and I was very concerned when Jake and Maggie, my little brother and sister, then eight and seven, came to see me in the hospital. I was their big brother. I was in the Marine Corps. I was invincible. That's how they saw me, but I didn't know if they would see me that way anymore. Fifteen years have passed since September 11, 2001. Like, like Aaron's, a disfigured veteran's mirror test should become our own. Individual Americans reflecting on what it means when a country, but not a nation, goes to war and is still at war. So that sets up the whole book. Um, I think it's a powerful uh, reminder of the human cost of war. And if anything, I think one of the primary themes I tried to get across is that warfare in Washington is remote. A lot of, I'm sure, what General Paxton deals with, with General Dunford and General Neller and, and, and many other top generals is, um, a lot of uh, meetings, a lot of paper flow with high levels on the civilian side. Um, experience of our leaders, which I know he and others also have on the ground, is where the two don't often meet enough. And the book is an attempt to bring the ground level and not also forget about the strategic decisions that drive the policy that we implement on the ground. I was in Washington uh, a week or so ago, and one of my former bosses, uh, Ambassador Pickering, was helping frame the book, and he was kind of like a five-star general in the State Department. We don't have a lot of them. And he said, you know, it's a truth-telling book, and we need more of that in Washington. So of all the reviews I've received so far, I, I think that's my favorite. And it's not a book that's going to win me any friends, actually, whether I'm with my Republican friends and my Democratic friends. If I succeed in this book, it'll be, I hope, because I'm an honest guide. And I'm saying, come with me. Uh, let's see the wars uh, for what they are. You'll see some of the horrific things. You'll see some of the things that were, were, were pretty good, the friendships, the, the partnering with Iraqis and Afghans. Um, and, and, and I needed to be credible in that role. And I worked very hard with my editors to weed out the stuff that didn't belong that were in my earlier drafts. It's not an anti-war book. I'm not anti-war, uh, but I am anti-wrong war. Uh, and I consider uh, the way I organized the book uh, to reflect that. Uh, the first section is called The Wrong War, and that covers my time, which was amounted to about four years in, in Iraq. The second section uh, is The Right War, and I believe uh, our beginnings, at least in Afghanistan, were a necessary and a right war. How we fought that war, we could talk about for a long time. And then the third, third section, which added another three, uh, two to three hundred pages, which we didn't foresee initially, uh, is um, home. And I, I wanted to include that because, of course, unlike the Iraqi and the Afghan people, uh, whose war front is their neighborhood, their home front, uh, we all one day come home to a place that, while far from perfect, is not uh, constantly at war like Afghanistan has been for many decades and Iraq has been for, 
for also a long time. So that's the structure of the book. Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll maybe address why I added a mini four section, which is called a uh, After War. And that's not my writing. And I was asked in Portland or Denver maybe, you know, if there were part of the book that you had to save, you know, you only had one copy, what would it be? And there was a fire in the library. Uh, it would be that part. It would be the part where I include a soldier's war journal. He's a U.S. Army soldier, not a Marine, ironically, uh, writing about his time in Sadr City. And as an amateur historian, I think what his journal does is it's pure writing. Tons of typos, tons of just, here's how my day was, which is why I loved it. And I had to tell all the editors in New York, don't, don't fix it. That's what makes it honest. That's what makes you know, the Civil War journals, the World War I journals so powerful. And then following uh, that section are the comments by the friends and family of uh, the 31 service members who were killed in a, in a tragic helicopter crash in uh, January 2005. And I've talked quite a bit about that in other uh, media interviews. And um, many of you are probably familiar with that. But I felt that, that that's also an important testament to who these uh, humans were, who these Marines were, who who they are still to those who love them the most. So that is actually, I feel, the most important part of my book. Quickly here, in maybe the 15 minutes or so I've got before we open it up to questions, um, what are the themes? I'm gonna pose a couple of questions right now before I get into that, uh, which I, I usually do. Uh, and I did with a room full of, of people in New York that I write about, and that is what words do you all associate with the United States of America right now? Any words, we don't need to answer right now, but what words come to mind uh, to you today in, what is it, June of 2016? And then if I were to ask that question of a room full of Iraqis, Afghans, Brazilians, Canadians, Japanese, you know, whoever it is, what words might they put forward that they associate with the United States right now? So that's the pop quiz. My mom was a fifth grade school teacher. She taught me the value of a pop quiz. We'll, we'll come back to that because I think they're, they're very important questions that uh, really flow from the 42 or so chapters in my book. It's been 15 years since 9-11. I think if, if anything, it's time for us to look into that mirror and, and acknowledge where the cracks are, acknowledge where the successes are. This is not a, an indictment book, I think. Some of the early books on the wars have all been, this is everything that went wrong. I wanted to try and show where things worked. And for those of you, and I know General Paxton, as you travel, you see Americans making partnerships that are gonna last. And in Afghanistan in particular, I try and show some of our tax dollars I think are still you know, working in the right ways. Some of the schools we built were destroyed, but some were not. So again, you're the judge of the book, but if I succeeded, it's, it's a balanced take. It's not, a, I think, an easier book, which would have just been an indictment book. How the wars got started, how we fought them, uh, how do they look going forward, those are, I think, sort of implied themes. I did not want to write all about 2003, but I also felt it important uh, to, to remember how our, our country uh, went, went to war after 9-11 and the decisions that our, our leaders made uh, that we were either halfway supportive of or looking the other way or maybe fully in support of. I was at our mission in New York City at the United Nations, so I was in the room when Secretary Powell you know, held up the vial and said anthrax. And very late in the writing process, I, uh, I opted to, to write about that. And if you wanna ask me why, I can, I can answer that question. Um, another theme, accountability. I think there's been too little of that in these wars, especially on the civilian side. Uh, I was not always good at holding myself accountable in the early days. Um, I think I got better over time. I found that the accountability on the military side was, was much better and much more immediate. Um, and I, I learned a lot by seeing leaders like General Larry Nicholson uh, really, really um, make some tough decisions um, on accountability and beyond just the strategy we were trying to pursue. 
Reflection and reckoning, the two R's. Um, I think war inherently forces all of us to reflect a lot uh, about what happened and why it happened. And then I think uh, for all of our troops and many Marine friends of mine, there's a personal reckoning that goes on. I hope that perhaps we are part of a national reckoning also. But the first step, I think, is how we all reckon with decisions we made, um, people we helped, people we left behind. Uh, those are all some of the stories in the book. It's a nonfiction book. I was jealous of uh, my friends who write novels because I wanted to write different endings sometimes. I wanted to write a better conclusion uh, or a, a less read chapter than some of my chapters are. But as a nonfiction writer, at least at this stage of my writing career, I believe there's power in uh, truth telling as it happened, as best you can. So that factors into the education element of my book. I, I don't consider it to be homework, but some students who maybe are assigned it one day may view it that way. But there is education involved. Who were the Iraqis? Who were the Afghans? Because uh, we're good at telling our own stories. It's harder to tell the stories from their perspective. And since I spent a ton of time over there, I think I, I have a, an easier time getting into the Iraqi or the Afghan perspective. Finally, on themes, and then I'll, I'll end here with the photos and the pop quiz. It's not an us versus them book. Um, it's not a drive-by book, although some may read it that way. I worked very hard to have it be proportionate to war, which is that um, we worked with Iraqis, we worked with Afghans. They were not the other when it came to my job. Uh, when my Iraqi and Afghan friends were killed, it hurt a lot. When my Marine friends were killed, it also hurt a lot. Um, it's not an us and them book versus the State Department and the Defense Department warfare that sometimes goes on inside our government. Uh, if anything, you know, General Neller and General Zomer, General Nicholson, General Dunford, all of these incredible leaders in Ombar taught me how um, to get along. And uh, one general in particular, after I had arrived in Fallujah for about a week, I won't name him because he's still in government in a very important job, said, Kale, you know, there's a way of dealing with generals. That's not the way of dealing with generals. And I, I respected that because it would have been very easy for this general to have said, oh, I'll let the State Department guy kind of like go off into the minefield. And he was in Ramadi and I was in Fallujah. And uh, I remembered that. And it showed that he was looking out for me, not just for, you know, at that time, the first Marine Division issues. And I still think I was right, but he was right to correct me, <laughs> um, which is part of my problem. But we worked out the solution together. It wasn't like State Department was at war with uh, the Marine Corps or the Defense Department. And it's not us and them, again, when it comes to Americans, Iraqis, and Afghans. If anything, I think we need to look at these wars um, from their perspective as much as we can, because this is a book still written by an American. And, and one day, I hope there's a stack of great novels, great poetry from, from troops who have been over there, and also great accounts by the Iraqi and the Afghan writers. And all together, then, I think we'll have a pretty good feel for, for some of the truth uh, of these wars. Couple minutes on photos. Um, I always tell people to start with the photos, um, not just because they're color, but because they're actually very carefully selected. They're previews of, of what, what is in the book, and uh, my editor Tim O'Connell and, and Andrew Ritker uh, picked some photos that I never would have picked, even though they're my photos. And, and I think we wanted to do right by the faces that are represented. A lot of Marines are in those photos, uh, a lot of Iraqis, a lot of Afghans, and I, I'll highlight a few of them. Um, there's a, quite a f display of what Fallujah looks like after a big battle, and of course today, if you turn on the news, Fallujians are trying to save their children by floating across you know, the Euphrates River in tires. Um, it's tragic all around, tragic, I think, for all of us who, who lived part of our lives in Iraq and especially tragic for the Iraqi people. So those photos, unfortunately, are uh, more apparent uh, today than I think they would have been if my book had come out a few years ago. There are characters named Walid Dari, uh, Fallujah Highway Patrolman, the, uh, the mayor of Fallujah, um, Sheikh Kamal, who was assassinated, 
the, the photos of three sons and what it looks like in their face when I'm paying blood money or condolence payments for uh, the deaths of their fathers. Uh, Dilawar of Yakubi is an Afghan whose story I think should always be remembered. Um, a girl in red, this whole issue of girls' education. I tried to write a chapter that got to that moral dimension of, of our effort, but I think that photo does a better job of reminding us what uh, we, we said we were going to do and whether we should continue to do it or not. And I think that's up to all of us to, to figure out. Did some road trip uh, traveling as well to various places and, um, and included some of those photos and then ended the book in New York. Having lived in New York for four years, I felt I always wanted to start it at 29 Palms, where Marines come from, where Marines are trained, and ended in New York City where on 9-11 our government had some very important decisions to make. Um, so those are the bookends and the wars are in between. Quickly back to the, uh, the quiz and then we'll maybe do some back and forth uh, how you'd like to do with the Q&A. What words come to mind? And you can yell it out and I'll repeat it so people can hear uh, and then we'll transition into the uh, formal question and answer session. What words do you associate with the United States right now? Contentious. Contentious. Freedom, it's election day in California, so exactly, yep. Naive, guilty as charged, for sure I was. Sorry? Idealistic, all good words. I think Portland's a bit more left than San Francisco based on what you're telling me, which is hard to believe, but uh, <laughs> uh, the Portland crowd was, uh, was, uh, was good too. I think they went on the left spectrum, yeah. Gentleman in the back. Respect. Anyone else have a few words you want to? I heard all of that, um, you know, in many of, of my visits. Um, positive, some not so positive. Uh, yep. Arrogant. Arrogant. I definitely heard that a lot. Economically divided. Confused. <laughs> Confused. I think that's a good, good new one I haven't heard before, especially on election day. Um, Confused, good. What would you think that the Iraqi or the Afghan people would, would say or the words they associate with the United States? Power. Power. Arrogant. Devil. Devil. Interesting. Naive. Naive, again. Yeah. Anything positive? I heard some positive from them. I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. There is a sense of opportunity education. Um, they think we're rich, so they would say money, you know, but, but there were, there was a more balanced, I think, take than just the indictment. But I don't want to get into a word match game for the rest of the night, but I think it's important that we do think about how we see ourselves and how, I would say even more importantly, how others see us, especially at a time for 15 years when I think there has been a, a curtain pulled about where we're strong and sometimes where we're weak. I mean, we can fight hard, and we're showing we can fight long. Um, but we can also, I think, show the world our best sometimes while we're also showing them our worst. Um, and at a time when we're figuring out who the next commander in chief, in our view, should be, uh, it's a very important, I think, uh, equation to think about. That's basically a 15 or 20 minute presentation I had. I, I hope you'll uh, feel free to ask me anything you want, whether it's about the book, whether it's about the State Department, whether it's about foreign policy in general, uh, I'm usually game for uh, any question. So thank you for coming, thank you for hosting, and I look forward to the Q&A. One of the questions from the audience will go right into it to the very top level. I was gonna save it till the end, but since you mentioned it, um, how do you identify a potential commander in chief who knows the difference between the wrong war and the right war. What are some of the things, the criteria points that you might look for? First, I was, it's a very good question. Um, and it will take a little bit longer than, than planned to answer. I think that wisdom, the last quote in my book is wisdom begins at the end. And I irritated my publisher because I wanted these quotes the whole way through. But at the very end, I really believe that in Washington, there's a deficit of wisdom. And I think wisdom comes from experience. So when it comes to 
whether a commander in chief can determine a right war or a wrong war, I don't think you're going to get there by age 35, although constitutionally you could become our commander in chief or 40 or 45. I think that, that it's a, almost something you feel and know or you don't. So without naming candidates, if the candidate doesn't strike me as wise, I don't think I would want them to be my commander in chief. Um, I think right and wrong wars, you know, also I think can, can reflect how much is the nation behind the war. Um, I think that the American people over time and overall get the big issues right. Wars are very easy to start. As we are learning, they're very hard to, to end. I think if you've got military background, it's not a requirement. Uh, but I think that could be very useful these days. I'm still hoping for a new Eisenhower in some level, a Democratic Eisenhower, a Republican Eisenhower, it doesn't matter. But I do think that, that having lived through war gives you an idea uh, and a reality check in a way that uh, perhaps you'll only get by being in war. And then I would say maybe the last point, um, how to choose right and wrong, wrong wars, is listen to people who have been around the block and also build the relationships with other world leaders. I think that when I used to be in New York, the American president would arrive in the Grand Hall. There's leader, there are leaders and then there's the American president. And you know, I was there for both Bush and Clinton. And you know, the, the gravitational pull of an American president is tremendous. Anyone will return the call of the American president. But the question is, does the American president reach out and do these candidates reach out to gain the wisdom from other people, other leaders? And I know our generals travel around the world a lot and have great relationships with their counterparts from around the world. And so I think that decision of right and wrong will often come from what Secretary Schultz, you know, the former Secretary of State said, that diplomacy is, which is gardening. You know, your garden, I'm not a really a gardener, but it's a beautiful image, which is gardening requires consistency. It requires, you know, doing it on a regular basis. I think um, wisdom, I think relationships come from that. So um, I think the wrong wars are perhaps easier uh, to define than the right wars. And I could name places, but maybe, maybe later. Um, before you were dispatched out to military operations. You were working in Baghdad in the, uh, the provisional authority at the time, coalition provisional authority. And one of my favorite quotes in the book, uh, I basically became Jimmy Hoffa. Um, can you share some of that experience? I thought that was a fascinating part of the book. Now, I'm glad you brought up the truckers of Iraq. I, I was, again, suit and tie world in New York uh, early in my career. And, had a lot of free lunches in Manhattan. But uh, when I got to Baghdad, um, I was assigned to deal with the, the truckers of, of Iraq. And it was kind of a, what do I have, what do I know about uh, trucking? Um, but I realized that, that it was going to become really important to our effort. Because if you don't move food and you don't move the things that people need to survive around Iraq, as the insurgency's getting worse, uh, we're going to be not able to even think about having an election or not even being able to think about anything that our government at the time wanted. So my job was to meet with a gentleman named Bassam, who was basically the head of a very important trucking union, really. And I, I tell a story. My whole year in Baghdad, I boiled down to the truckers, which I'm trying to do right by them, because they really taught me more than anything I learned in the palace. You know, And I was, I was part of the problem, I admit it. You know, I, I came there with a lot of naivety or whatever the word, however you say it right. I was very naive, and yet I stuck it out. And, and I think my learning curve became shorter and shorter as the war got redder and redder. But what Bassam taught me and the truckers taught me is they're out among the people, the every, everyday average Omar and Ali's every day. So they were telling me early on what Iraq needs is an even fist. They told me that in 2003, you know, not a fist that only smacks down one side or the other. Um, but I was hearing that in 03. So the truckers were my first real interface with the Iraqi people, and that was hugely valuable. And I started to realize this is a job not about UN Security Council resolutions in New York that I had been working on or drafting. It's about how war affects 
everyday people. And they, they really introduced me to the real Iraq. Yeah, the, the roads and the rivers were the lifeline. You know, the Tigris and the Euphrates and the road networks. And that was the, a lot of our military presence was the population centers and to take care uh, of those uh, road networks. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about, you described diplomacy before the Iraq war as having failed by design. That's a quote out of your book. Diplomacy before the Iraq wa uh, war failed by design. What did you mean exactly by that? It's a good question and I'm getting it. I'm getting asked it a lot, which I'm, I'm all in favor for because I think our instinct is to think, oh, 2002, 2003, it's ancient history. No. You know, I, I mentioned I was in the room when Secretary Powell made the case to the world, and I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in Secretary Powell. I think he, his, his story, his statesmanship is lacking in so many ways in our government and in Washington. Um, but I'll extend it to what I believed really was the genesis of the war, which was a small number of people who really wanted the war. Uh, and there have been many good books written about that. On the diplomatic track, we were trying to get UN agreement through the Security Council, Ambassador Negroponte and Sir Jeremy Greenstock, the British Perm Rep, um, to bring the world with us. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, your military and General Paxton and others will know this better than anyone, you know, you've got to start planning for a potential land war. So we had two tracks, the diplomatic track and the military track. Well, I think I told the story to Terry Gross or someone that when I I had a Marine friend who was a reservist, and he said, hey, sir, we just got the roadmap to Baghdad. And that was like, we were going with the suit and ties into the Security Council, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, what's really up here? But I believe, you know, it was a war of choice, and that if we were serious about perhaps not entering this war, um, a couple of other things could have happened. Um, they didn't happen. I think that the two key people beyond President Bush were Tony Blair and Colin Powell. And I think a lot of people wanted to believe that our government was doing the right thing at a time of fear, right after 9-11. And I think there was a conflation. And so therefore, I think that the war track was always going to be superseding the diplomatic track. I wish I had a different assessment. Um, you were against the Iraq war why did you go forward and deploy and volunteer for duty there when intrinsically you felt against it? Because I would be lame if I sat in New York and just complained about it. I mean, you know, you go really where, I did that for a week, I write about it, and my friends told me that's kind of, we've, we've heard enough of that. Um, but, you know, you go where you're needed. You go, it's like, in a way, when you're in the Marine Corps, I think, you know, you go where your nation needs you, and if your nation isn't really mobilized for a war. I have to say, that that's a noble sounding thing and that is true, but I knew it would be the best and worst job I'd ever have. And the best part of that job is I had a huge leash. You know, I wasn't a senior guy and I knew that my bosses were gonna let me um, do a lot, especially when I went out to Fallujah and General Conway was the first general I, uh, I worked with. And boy, is that a great lesson in terms of how our military leaders work because he was the first Marine leader I, I, I worked with and he taught me a lot and in terms of command presence. I didn't know what command presence was around civilians. I got to Fallujah and I was filled with rooms full of command presence and that really uh, was reassuring because that was when Ambar really started to fall apart. So as I stayed, I thought this is the best job I'll ever have. It will also be the worst job I'll ever have because of the, the death and the horrific things that I do write about as well. Um, but it was also good for my career to a point because I think Ambassador Negroponte, my bosses were very understanding that he's out in Fallujah. So, you know, let him, let him work with the Marines and do what they need to do. And that was, that was rewarding. You know, your book does a really good job of kind of tracing the, the ups and downs. And uh, personally, I remember being on the USS Bataan in 2003 and watching Secretary Powell explain why military action was necessary. And I, and I believed it and in my mind reconciled that this was the right thing to do and we had to do this. Um, after we got to Baghdad, there was that euphoria of uh, you're there, but it was like the dog that caught the car. Uh, you, you, you bit into the bumper and now what do you do? 
Um, we we uh, started uh, nation building 101. In, we in, were neighborhood building and, right and, before long. Yeah. And so uh, things were going okay until the Iraqi army was disbanded and we all of a sudden had uh, disenfranchised Sunnis that were trained in how to use military hardware and they were pretty angry with what had happened. Um, then we, we went through a very kinetic period and then we had the Anbar awakening where the tribes came and we were able to negotiate with the tribes and I lived through that. There was also then a feeling of optimism that things were starting to move in the right direction. And part of why we withdrew was that things were really quiet in those regions that were really uh, volatile previously. Uh, and then we pulled out. You can, could have or should have any of these things, but do you see it as a series of points where uh, poor decisions were made each time we faced a really key decision point? And do you think that had we looked at Iraq like Korea or Germany or Japan, that we had garrisoned forces there uh, indefinitely to ensure that there was a uh, security to allow uh, the, the marketplace and the economy to grow again, mm. that it would have been different now? You're asking, you're all asking really good, hard questions. This one, I think, um, I think once we invaded, this was never going to end well, period. So I'll start with that premise that, that once we, you know, I think it was Secretary Powell who, who talked about the boiling water, there was a lid on it. So I'll start there, that I think the Americans invading with 150,000 troops in 2003 was going to break open something, you know, Pandora's box, but People forget it, the bottom of Pandora's box was what? Hope. We never saw enough of hope in the bottom of that box that we opened. Um, that said, we did have policy decisions to, to make um, to try and make a bad situation better. I was out west with the Sunnis, so my bias, my perspective, my living as you were uh, is gonna be framed by the badlands of western Iraq. Um, the Sunnis hated us by and large for most of those early years. People forget Lance Corporal Marine Corps was the highest KIA WIA rate for most of the early period of the war. Why? Because it was our, I think General Conway at the time was commanding 38,000 troops. We had MEF CGs at Camp Fallujah. I mean, that shows you the scale of our effort over there. Um, so we were in the worst neighborhood for bridge building. Uh, we were fighting an insurgency uh, that was largely, I think, driven by locals, not by Syrian foreign fighters, not by what Washington wanted to believe. And I write about that in the Potato Factory chapter, which is where these bodies were being processed and we were trying to figure out, are they Syrians or are they homeboys? You know, My boss, Ambassador Ford and Negroponte, go spend time in the Potato Factory. Not a fun chapter, but one that was important. I think that Washington tended to be to the generals, go fight, report back every once in a while. And you know, I wrote about the civilians coming to the war. It's actually a very important chapter with the senators and the congressmen coming to the war because they're the ones that vote for war and then they're the ones that I think in Washington are trying to manage the strategic effort as well as what the American people are, are supporting. To the question of what we could have done, I believed we needed a buffer in Western Iraq. I, I was talking with Ambassador Ford about anchors, anchors west and anchors north. Um, I wrote a descent cable based on some of the other things and I think I was right in some ways and very wrong in other ways. But I always believed that the Sunnis um, were gonna gravitate toward their worst instincts if they didn't see a future in their own country. That said, I used to spend every day of the week almost in downtown Fallujah telling Sunnis and Fallujians you're not gonna be in power again. So you can ship car bombs into Baghdad all you want, but your government does have legitimate issues about the instability that the West brings to the capital. So what's going on today? Baghdad has redirected forces to Fallujah, to the West, because of the tremendous bloodshed that was going on in Iraq. I tell people also very openly, and I did it then, that every year in Fallujah, I understood 1% truly of what was going on. So the dynamic shifted, I think, from less what the Americans could do to what was unfolding between Shia power brokers in Iran and what was happening on our border out west where you were as well, I know, uh, with the Syrian dynamic and the Saudi dynamic. It became a very regional issue here. 
And so our ability as Americans to shape the future um, was going down and down and down and down. And we hate to admit that because we're the Americans. There's never a solution that we can't figure out. And I know I love our Marine Corps, but there's no mission the Marine Corps can't accomplish. So if you put too many troops on the ground, which if you want to talk about going forward, it may become a quicksand uh, environment again. So the Iraqi dynamic, I think, started to trump whatever role the Americans could actually have. If we had kept troops, I think, in Iraq, um, and I understand why the administration had a hard time doing that, um, because of the, the dynamic with the Shia-dominated government, you probably could argue that we wouldn't have as much of a problem in Western Iraq for sure that we have now. But there would have been a host of other problems because the real winner of the Iraq war, it's a cliche, but it's true, is Iran. Not America. And definitely not the Iraqi people. Did that answer the yeah, question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, so That's what, just my view. I, I've been away from government for a long time, but I, I'm in touch with probably more Iraqis than half of our government, if not all of our government. But let, let's, let's shift um, over to your experience in Afghanistan. So Iraq was the wrong war. Afghanistan, uh, in a way, is the right war. Can you expand on that a little bit? Why, why is that the right war? Why did you call it that? Right, necessary war. Again, in New York, when we were negotiating resolutions, there were pre-existing UN Security Council resolutions on Osama bin Laden. I mean, again, I like, I'm a history guy, and we always need to remind ourselves of important history points. Well, we had a pretty significant sanctions regime against uh, Al Qaeda before 9-11. So when our government uh, said under President Bush, George W. Bush, to the Taliban government, hand over Osama bin Laden, what did they do? They, they basically said no. I mean, they basically were not going to do it. So President Bush, I think, had uh, a real cause to tell the generals start coming up with the with the war plan um, the diplomacy had been tried actually with that issue and it didn't get very far uh, I joined the State Department to prime, try and prevent wars but sometimes I think wars are necessary so we started bombing Tora Bora we know how it went from there it didn't go very well the Taliban slipped over into Pakistan they waited us out and we you know redirected to Iraq. So I think that, that the other side is that Afghans actually were sort of more on board with us coming into their country. And I, having lived in both countries, there's a big difference between being in Western Iraq where people look at you like, get out of here, versus the Afghan people who had perhaps too high of expectations for us. But they did see 43 member states come in to try and help their country. So in that way, not only did it feel like I, b I believed it was a necessary war. Um, it felt like it was an effort that was welcomed by and large. Iraq had the complete opposite feel, especially among the Sunni people. So yes, a necessary war, a right war, that then became a very mishandled war, but one we had to start. Um, Rajiv uh, Chandra Sekharan wrote a book called Little America, and in that he talks about uh, General Nicholson as well. And he was uh, a bit critical in how U.S. forces were deployed and really zeroed in on the Marines of, of having a, a marina stand, of taking Helmand Province and, and centralizing their efforts there where you know, his opinion was population centers were more important. As a State Department, person working for the military, what was your with, opinion? I never worked for. My boss <laughs> working, was totally Working with, I stand corrected, working with the, <laughs> That's the military. It is, it is. Um, how, how did you uh, see that uh, operational uh, level uh, playing out? Well, no, it's a good question on, on Marinistan. Um, we inherited the central Helmand River Valley uh, when General Nicholson and I arrived. And General Nicholson, Larry Nicholson and I strategically never wanted to be apart because we see the world by and large the same way. And, and Rajiv, to his credit, spent a lot of time with us. There were British forces that were already in, in Helmand. So the political lead was actually Her Majesty's government, the British. 
Um, but when the Marines arrived, the governor at the time, Governor Mangle, loved the Marine Corps. We all love the Marine Corps, but the governor especially loved the Marine Corps, and he you know, felt, I think, that he could move into new areas almost as a governor general. Um, I would walk it back even more. So Marina Stan was a reality. Uh, we started with 10,672 troops with the 2nd MEB. By the time we left, we were at just under 20,000. General Jones, as National Security Advisor, former Commandant, famous General, showed up at Camp Leatherneck in May of, all blur now, May of nine, and said, you know, you're not gonna get any more. He was speaking literally for the White House, you know, whiskey, tango, foxtrot, if you think you're gonna get more troops. Within six months, we doubled our numbers. So to go back to the strategery of the wars, within six months, they had completely reversed themselves. We're on the ground trying to fight the war. General Nicholson, great leader. There's a reason why I stayed in these wars. It's, it was to be around someone like him. Very much a grunt general, very much a wise general together. Uh, when we were looking at Northern Helmand and we were looking at where the British were starting to pull back, this is going to require a bit of explanation, the British people wanted out of that war before even our nation started to be like, what are we doing over there? So we knew that the map was contracting on the British side. The question then became, as we doubled in numbers, should we go into places where the British uh, had started, which included Nauzad, which is the, the killing fields of a lot of young Americans, double, triple amputees, I mean, sang in Kajaki later on after we left. And General Nicholson's argument, which was a legitimate argument, was is that Nauzad represented everything that was wrong with the war to that point, which was that it was a stalemate, that the Taliban you know, we're basically encroaching and that we had to show that the stalemate wasn't good enough. And I completely understood that, that argument. Um, my position wasn't entirely different. My position was just that this is year eight of the longest war of American history. What's our sustainability? And General Nicholson and I agreed on that. I faulted that when President Obama decided to surge 33,000 or escalate 33,000 troops into that war and then say in two years we're starting to leave, that's a presidential decision. I follow orders just like anyone else. Um, but I was always arguing let's go as low as we can to go as long as we need to. When you talk about Korea, um, I think our, our endurance is what's important in, in these wars, not our escalation. You go up quickly, the temptation is to go down quickly. So General Nicholson, Rajiv was in the room. I would send cables to Holbrook and stuff. I mean, I was saying, you know, the lowest number we can get to, the fewer Americans getting their legs blown off, horrific damage, and General Nicholson and I spent so much time at Bastion Hospital, which I write about. We understood better than anyone the cost of these wars. So we did not want, and he did not want, Marines to go off into some expedition. I fault a government that says we're gonna send in 33,000 more troops, go work it, generals. And that's, I think, an important point that maybe we'll get to, is that I always felt like we had stronger military leadership than we had civilian leadership. And generals want strong civilian leadership. I mean, all good generals want a good political game plan. It's not their job to figure out the politics of a country. Yeah, that was a, a, a good answer to a tough question. Um, given the current situation you have, the ISIS sprang out of Al Qaeda in Iraq. It, it's permeated Afghanistan. It's in North Africa. It's franchising itself in different places. Um, you know, we have a full out onslaught on Fallujah again right now. And those of us who have been in that city tend to go and gravitate toward the web pages and news pages and look at the pictures. And mm -hmm. we're kind of, you know, tied to that. Those places have meanings to us. So, what's, in your opinion, and you could ask a military person the same thing, but as a, as, a, as a diplomat, what is the best possible outcome if we were to make the right decisions? Is this something you contain? Is this something that has to be uh, uh, really dealt with in detail? Um, is it an Arab problem that we should stand back and only provide air support? What is really the best outcome here uh, from your seven years of experience living this? I don't see any any really good outcome right now. I, like you, I, you know, even today flying from Portland, you know, the, the images of, 
You know, I was KLL Fallujah, for better or for worse. So, you know, there are good people in Fallujah. There are also plenty of bad people that are in Fallujah. Um, part of my book is to remind people that Fallujah wasn't just terror centrally. There are families with children, and you see them on TV today, drowning, you know, to get across the river. I don't see any good options, actually, anytime soon. I don't, I don't see that, you know, with the current administration, and I don't fault them. These are all hard jobs, as you know, whether you're in the military command structure or the civilian command structure. Sometimes you only have bad to worse decisions to make. Um, I think with the election today in California and our new whoever's going to be our next commander in chief, things are going to be on hold. I don't think President Obama is going to change anything dramatically, um, and there's understandable reasons for that. So air will continue to be, I think, what, what we do and what we use. I think we'll continue to try and support a prime minister that's better than the uh, prior one, but is still very, very weak. I think you're going to continue to have disintegration of the country in many ways. I think that um, on the Syrian side, uh, maybe there's a bit of overlap now with the Russians that will open up some things that, that weren't possible before. I think that the Sunnis don't even know who their leaders are right now. So when I ask my Iraqi friends, who are really the ones that should have the answers more than any American, even someone uh, like myself who spent all the time over there, they don't even have, I think, an answer, and that's what's, what's quite uh, disturbing. Finally, though, I would say, I think from a domestic point of view, um, we started that war. So people say, well, I was asked in, uh, maybe it was Denver, what if we hadn't invaded Iraq? What would Iraq look like? Interesting question, you know, hypothetical. Uh, all I know is that the Iraqis would own it. You know, that it would have been an Iraqi dynamic. It would have been an Iraqi, uh, whether the Arab Spring morphed into something that Saddam could keep you know, out of his country or not. We'll never know. But since we invaded in 2003, I believe that we as a nation have a moral aspect to how we wield our power. Um, and I try and you know, get to some of those questions in the book as well, which is it's not just about bombs and bullets. It's about you know, the partnerships we made on the ground. It's about, you know, the things we say we stand for and do we still stand for them even though there's been a meltdown uh, in, in the war that we chose to go into. I have a hard time thinking that we do this. And Donald Trump's interesting because he'll say, and I'll raise his name, he'll say, let's take their oil but let them all just take care of themselves. I mean, it's this, this notion that we would go in and take the oil um, but just let them fight it out among themselves. I mean, if he had actually a plan to like implement that, I know no general that would ever say, yeah, let's go take the, I mean, I shouldn't speak for you guys, but let's go take the oil fields and then just let them, you know, just suck the oil out. There's just no rationale to that whatsoever. This is the first time I've really crossed the line and named names, but maybe I should start. There's just no logic to that. Even if I like Trump, I would tell him, there's no logic to that. Anyway. So let's go back to the very beginning in the quote and talking about the mirror test. The cover of this book has a picture of the American flag, a pristine new one, and then below it there's a tattered flag. And I want to ask you about the imagery there, but I also want to go back to, and I wrote this down as you read it a second ago, refusing to see the truth, how hurt I was. And then I think about your book cover, and then I think about what does the national reckoning look like? You talk about a national reckoning for the longest period of, of, of war in American history. Uh, after Vietnam, there were books like Bright Shining Lie, which your book has been compared to. There are books like Rumor of War and Bing West's The Village. These were part of the reckoning, the books that came out following. And then there were the films. And you've already got, you, we're on a, you know, we've got this technology, we've already got books, we've already got films of these. This is all part of the reckoning as well. Where do you see that going? It's about time, you know, we, you know, that preface is 15 years in from, from 9-11, and Aaron, you know, Aaron and other especially facially dis disfigured troops don't have the option, you know, they have to reckon. And I think to, to do right by them, uh, whether, you know, you're part of the Marine family or whether you're just a concerned citizen, um, warfare is a serious thing a nation can do. And, um, you know, my dad and uncles were in Vietnam. One of my uncles almost died over there. My grandfather was World War II. Great uncle was World War II. Brother-in-law was a Gulf War. 
So not all wars have had equal reckonings and not all wars I think are, are equally um, parade worthy. But if we don't think about these wars, including how they got started, including how they are continuing to be fought, including what the human cost of these wars are, our side as well as the Iraqi, the Afghan and other coalition members, um, I don't think that there's any chance at all that, that the, the wars will, will end the way even remotely like we want them to. The books, I think, are getting interesting, uh, and I credit a lot of writers out there, uh, veterans, um, civilians. Uh, Lee Carpenter uh, wrote a very good book um, from the, the mother-son relationship. Phil Clyer wrote an excellent book, a short story collection that gets the grunt marine voice, I think, better than anyone. Elliot Ackerman, Matt Gallagher, I mean, Roy Scranton's got a book coming up. These, all these writers are, are, are adding to the uh, canon. Um, I'm still waiting, and I, mine's now a small part of that. It's a thick book, but it's you know a nonfiction account that I think is doing something different as well. But I'm still waiting for you know that Iraqi, that Afghan novelist, that Iraqi, that Afghan short story writer, that Iraqi, that Afghan playwright. And some of that's beginning. I mean, there are some, you know, Corpse Washer, a couple of short story collections that are getting out there. The movies so far, since you raised the media, I don't think are very reflective of these wars. Billy Lynn's Halftime Walk was an excellent book, I thought. I thought written by Ben Fountain as a civilian. He gets to some of the reckoning and accountability issues in a way better than, than a lot of what I've read. The movies coming out in the fall, uh, we'll see how that does. The Sniper movie I watched, um, we could have a whole panel on, on that based on what was going on in Ramadi and Fallujah at the time. Um, but at least it's happening, you know, and at least there's an investment in literature, at least there's an investment in, uh, in how we're trying to tell these stories to ourselves. I will make a pitch to all of you veterans and non-veterans across the country, if you're watching, keep writing, you know, keep pulling out your journal. I think there was a period about five years ago when I was like, no one gives a much about um, war writing. No one gives, no one cares much about the stories that are out there. Whether you're in Iowa, whether you're in Ohio, whether you're in Utah, whether you're in Florida, um, I believe the best books are still to be written. And I, I'm proud of what Knopf and I did through a lot of editing, and there are some zigs and zags in here that require patience, but I still believe the best books uh, are, are, are gonna be written by people uh, that probably aren't living in San Francisco or New York. Nothing against either of those cities, but I think that the way our military is filtering these stories, that it may be the kid you know, who's on the Iowa farm again, or maybe the kid here in San Francisco. It's just that it's gonna take time to have that reckoning, because reckoning and reflection and these great Vietnam books did not happen for a while. In fact, Tim O'Brien's The thing, Things They Carried, do you remember what year that was uh, published? 80s. 1990. 1990. Yeah, yeah. so you know, it, it takes time. Yeah. Um, Kale, there's too much good stuff in your book to get to every question that we would have, I, but I really uh, was impressed and could relate as I read through your book. The only other thing that I'll mention is I really appreciate how you recognize Gold Star families, how you address them in your book, the respect and dignity that you show them. And I wanted to invite you to our uh, Gold Star Honor and Remembrance event that we do here every year in February. And so you'll get an invitation uh, uh, to come uh, uh, to that. I hope that the next commander in chief takes time to pick up your book and read it. And uh, with that, uh, Kale is gonna stay right here. If you have a book that you would like uh, to have signed, uh, we'll be able to do that. But Kale, on behalf of the Marines Memorial, thank you for coming to San Francisco. And uh, we could have gone for another hour, uh, but uh, we really appreciate uh, the work you've done, the service you provided, and uh, we hope you come back. Thank you, it was an honor. Really, really appreciate it.